Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and welcome some students up here. This is really exciting for me. Uh, you are about to hear from some potential future leaders of the space industry. These are all middle school and high school students from around the country who have built something that has actually gone into space, which is really cool. So let's see here. We'll go ahead and introduce you all. From left to right, we have Jeans in Space. We have Sophia Chin and Lisa Rezis. Uh, National Design Challenge is our second team. We have Elliot Lee and Cypranov Vin Katakrishnan. Uh, the third team is Student Spaceflight Experiments Program with Sydney Wagner and Evie Currington. Then we have Wisconsin Space Crystals, uh, Caitlin Twesme and Peyton Kelly Van Domelen. And then our last team is Zero Robotics with Adela Cervantes and Jack Timmons. So what we're going to do here is they each have five minute presentations to show you the research that they did, their experience with launching something into space and some uh, early data that they have right now. At 1130, we have a downlink with a astronaut on the International Space Station. Uh, we'll have about 20 minutes with him where we'll ask uh, all the students and I will ask them um, a few questions. And then if we have time at the end, we'll have some Q&A with the students. So as you listen to their presentations, um, kind of think about what questions you'd like to pose to them. And this, I think, is a really special event because it shows that the International Space Station, the National Laboratory, is such an asset, not just for basic R&D, but it's a way for students to actually have hands-on experience in bringing something into space, which means a few things. They're obviously getting some hands-on R&D experience, how to build something that is meant to go into space, but they're also going to a rocket launch and watching a rocket launch knowing that they've built something that is on top of that rocket, which I've never experienced before, and I am interested to hear from you all what that's like, because it has to be such a great feeling. Um, but then not only that, they get to come to places like this and talk about their experience. And so they're getting public speaking skills and science communication skills and all of this because of this wonderful laboratory we have in space. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Genes in Space. Maybe click the next slide. Is that not your presentation? Ah, there we go. I'm Sophia Jen. We're the 2017 Jeans in Space winners, and we're going to tell you about our Jeans in Space 5 mission that was launched last week. So, Jeans in Space is a national competition that challenges students to create experiments using a procedure called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to be launched aboard the ISS. So PCR is a method. So PCR is a method that amplifies specific fragments of DNA and is utilized for a wide variety of experimental designs, both on Earth and in space. So Sophia and I have independently entered the competition with questions and concerns about the future of spaceflight and astronaut health. So my experiment focuses on immunodeficiencies that astronauts experience as a result of spaceflight. So specifically, I focus on T cells, which are the key parts of the immune system. And um, so they mediate the whole immune response. And the way that I measure T cells is by looking at fragments of DNA that are formed during T cell development in the thymus called T cell receptor excision circles, or T-Rex. So T-Rex in the peripheral blood um, circulate throughout the body, and they don't have a specific purpose, but by looking at the number of T-Rex, um, we can measure the speed of the immune response, as the number of T-Rex directly correlates with the number of new T-cells being developed in the thymus. So my experiment is a PCR-based T-Rex assay of um, T-cells, and looking at um, mice as experimental organisms and gel electrophoresis to visualize the results. Um, so the first thing I did was a dilutions assay in order to look at, um, test the feasibility of a semi-quantitative PCR method as well as 
um, establishing the limits of dilution and testing the feasibility of this method. So as you can see, um, the results from both on Earth and in space are very similar. And so we looked at a five month and a three month old female. And so the way that our gel is read is that the intensity of the band correlates with how much DNA is present. Um, so the next thing we did was looking at a series of ages between male and female mice. And so we also looked at a rag knockout mouse, which is a mouse genetically engineered to lack an effective immune system. And if you look closely at the gel, you can see that there is no T-Rex band present, um, meaning that on, on board the ISS, you could easily detect an, an immunodeficiency in astronauts. So in conclusion, my results show that um, we can quickly and effectively look at the effect of spaceflight on the immune system, paving the road for us to be able to look at how long-term space travel is affecting astronaut health and maybe looking into how the immune system is changing if we want to go into long-term missions such as going to Mars. So in addition to amino deficiencies, another um, potential threat to human space exploration is cancer. And so my experiment um, kind of looked at the increased risk of cancer in space um, that may be caused by um, things like radiation and microgravity. Uh, so if we want to travel to Mars and beyond, it will be important to understand the effects and potential dangers that the space environment can pose on human health. Um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, exposure to microgravity and radiation is a particularly dangerous risk of spaceflight um, because studies have shown that radiation can cause uh, double-stranded breaks or single-stranded breaks, among many other types of damage to DNA. And studies conducted in simulated microgravity have shown that um, DNA, the expression of DNA repair genes, um, is actually lower um, when they are exposed to microgravity. Um, and so as a result of this um, damage to DNA, uh, DNA mutations can occur at a higher rate than they normally do on Earth. And this can result in genomic instability and predisposition to cancer. Genomic instability may appear in many forms, um, but one form of genomic instability that I was interested in was microsatellite instability. Um, and so microsatellite instability is characterized by a high frequency of mutations in microsatellites. And what microsatellites are, um, wait, oh, okay. Uh, okay, microsatellites are um, tandemly repeated sequences of DNA um, that are made up of D short DNA motifs ranging from two to five base pairs that are then repeated five to 50 times. And so by analyzing microsatellite instability in space, um, the, hope is that, the hope is that we can gain insight into um, the increased risk of cancer in space. And so what my experiment aimed to do is establish the feasibility of a multiplex PCR-based assay um, that would allow for the informative analysis of a large amount of microsatellites and um, could be used as a method of monitoring genomic integrity in space. Um, and so uh, using DNA extracted from microsatellite stable and microsatellite instable cell lines, multiplex PCR reactions um, were carried out on Earth and in space. Um, and the results were then analyzed using capillary electrophoresis. Um, and so these are the results of the experiment. And um, what we learned is that multiplex PCR can be used to accurately amplify microsatellites in space. Um, and so this could be used in the future and uh, might enable diagnostics aboard um, the International Space Station in the future. Um, I'll wrap this up really quick, but um, Genes in Space has been a life-changing experience for the both of us, and I think we've learned so much from it, um, and it's really cultivated our growth both as scientists and as people, um, and it's inspired us to want to continue to pursue science in the future and strengthened our aspirations to become scientists, and we're really grateful to have had the opportunity to be a part of it. Um, a special thanks to our mentors and our teachers, 
um, and the Genes in Space team and Genes in Space sponsors. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Elliot. And my name is Sai. We are from Troop 209 in Palatine, Illinois, uh, near Chicago. Uh, and we are representing our troop aims for space experiment. So our experiment tests whether an organism, E. coli, mutates at a different rate of change in microgravity as compared to Earth gravity. Uh, in our application of the AIMS test, we used a known cancer-causing mutagen, 4-nitroquinoline oxide, OK? and into the wells in various concentrations and measured the average time it took for them to mutate. The results could have implications for tissue growth or cancer research. To fit the 450 plus microliter wells into our experiment, which has to fit in a four by four by six inch box or 10 by 10 by 15 centimeter box as per the regulations, we had to design our own custom well plates, per se. Uh, we call it our carousel. It's basically a 3D octagon that holds up to eight well plates designed in a 14 by 5 well, uh, well configuration. Next slide, please. In our experiment, we have eight concentrations, with two of them being a negative and positive control. When we sent our experiment up to space, a stepper motor would rotate the carousel along with the well plates to align with an onboard camera to take pictures of the well plates. Once that happened, the photos would be saved to an SD card that was on station until further analysis. This happened with 16 pictures being taken for every hour, for every day, for the full 26 days. That's full. Next slide. Uh, the unit was on station for 26 days, and for each picture taken, we thought that there would be time and sensor reading that were put on a data file record. Uh, we expected over 9,000 pictures and 13,000 data file records. We launched our experiment to the International Space Station at uh, Kennedy Space Center uh, on August 14, 2017. On station, our unit was removed from the freezer, let set at room temperature for four hours to thaw, and then uh, installed in the Nanorax cabinet, and sanity tests were put in between the Nanorax uh, servers so that our units were verified operation. Our unit returned 13 days after completion and was opened meticulously on September 27, 2017. From what we can tell, our unit ran for the full uh, time on station, but an SD card formatting issue limited us to uh, only a, few, a, a less amount of pictures than we expected. Because of this, we took data points from that day we opened the experiment, and we recorded it. Please note that these were one of the only data points that we got from the ISS. Next slide. So after review of the ISS data, steps were taken to correct the mechanical issues and file system issues uh, before starting the ground unit tests. Uh, set, the second set of well plates were actually transferred by dry ice-filled coolers and loaded into the ground experiment. And sanity tests were executed on the ground experiment on um, February 27, 2018. The ground test was continually uploaded, and it was uploaded with data and the pictures. And the reason why we did this was that we could see if the experiment was op operating functionally and if it worked. Um, testing finished on May 17, 2018. 82 days later. Due to the fact that we have to rerun our experiment to get a strong conclusive results, we, have to, uh, we can only say that, a non that we can only suggest that there might have been a rate difference between the, our ISS experiment and the ground experiment. When comparing them, we saw that the ISS day seems to go almost twice as fast, but that's only a suggestion. To actually do this, we have to rerun our experiment. So we, suggest, so we would suggest that someone help us rerun the experiment. Next slide. I'm just saying, we've done this before. Next slide. OK. So, because of that. so this is how we captured our data. As you can see, purple means that the bacteria mutated. Uh, that the 
they did not mutate. Yellow means that they did mutate, and white means that they either died or it's leakage. Next slide. Uh, the project not only was a big deal in the scouting community, but it also impacted our team's lives uh, because we learned how to do uh, software coding, electronic, mechanical Houston, design. Houston, please call station for a voice check. Sounds like we have our astronaut on the line. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to us. Wow, thank we you. can see our astronaut. Nice <laughs> thank you. Hi, this is Emily Calandrelli. How do you hear me? Oh. I've got you loud and clear. Welcome to the International Space Station. Woo! Wow. This is very exciting. So I am here with a bunch of middle school and high school students here in San Francisco, California. And we have a few questions for you. We are with um, astronaut Drew Feustel. So. Um, I'm going to kick this off with a couple questions, and then I'm going to hand it over to the students. My first quick question is, can you talk, Drew, a little bit about how STEM has enabled your career as an astronaut? Over. Absolutely. Um, I think the point about STEM in my career is that I wouldn't be here without STEM. Um, I, I took some time after high school to determine what it was I wanted to do uh, as a profession and I attended community college for th three years, and at that time I worked as a mechanic as well, so I was exploring different options in my life, and uh, also uh, at community college I studied both industrial design, which is sort of an artistic uh, bent, and then also science. And in the end I decided that science was important to me and that I was curious, and I had a lot of questions about um, the earth and earth processes, and then I, so I went ahead and pursued a degree in uh, geosciences. And for me, um, that was the point at which I turned my attention to science and ultimately, that's what enabled me to become a scientist astronaut, and, and that's why I'm here today. Very cool. Uh, second question for you. What is it about the International Space Station that makes it such an incredible learning platform? Over. Well, uh, it really is an international uh, international sort of professional uh, laboratory in space. I mean, we have all the uh, capabilities up here that you find in many advanced laboratories on Earth, um, studying everything from agriculture to uh, medicine to biosciences. I mean, we cover the whole span, uh, Earth observation. Really, it's just a great platform for all science, not only for Earth observation and studying the effects of space on humans, but also looking at um, processes uh, important to human life on Earth. So the work we do here is off the Earth because we're in space, but really it's focused for the Earth and for the inhabitants of our planet. Thank you. My third question, and then I'll pass it off to the students, is how is the space station and various ISS STEM programs, like some of the ones we're hearing about today, helping to address gender and racial equality, and what else can be done? Well, as you know, uh, we have uh, we have uh, I, what I consider uh, a good representation of uh, females in, in as astronauts and working in the space program. Um, I would I consider that uh, in uh, around NASA and throughout our agency, um, we see at least 40 uh, upwards of 40 percent of females working in. Uh, um, um, high, high roles or, or important roles in, in management and engineering and technology. And we also have uh, excellent representation within the astronaut program itself. I believe 35% uh, of our astronauts uh, throughout, almost through the history of the program, have been female. We have uh, a female astronaut with us now, and, and on uh, every few missions, we have female astronauts that are part of this program. And so I, I think NASA is being very proactive about uh, trying to engage in that process and making sure that uh, we maintain gender equality and we value the inputs. In fact, those the, the females in our programs are great leaders for us and provide great opportunities uh, for the rest of us to excel uh, and become good followers uh, following their role models. Hello, my name is Lisa Rezis and I go to Stuyvesant High School in New York. And my question is, the current graduating class have had astronauts in space for their entire life. How is this current generation empowered through authentic student experiences with space? Uh, 
I think what is unique about the current generation, and I'm assuming, I mean, that is your generation, um, and it was almost my generation. I was born a few years before we actually went to space as, uh, as humans. Um, but the key is that um, I think space exploration and our view of Earth from space has allowed us to realize that the Earth, um, most importantly, the Earth is the only home for humans and that it's fragile. And we can see that it's very fragile from here. Um, I think it's important for us, as, as we share our experiences in space, what we're trying to convey to uh, who have not seen Earth from space, have not had this vantage point, is that um, Earth is small. And uh, I think every day with technology, uh, your generation realizes how small uh, our planet really is. Uh, when I was growing up, it seemed very far-fetched to be traveling around the world or speaking to somebody in a different nation easily just by ringing the phone. In fact, from space, from the space station, I can dial a call over an IP protocol phone, uh, uh, just like you would uh, from a computer to a computer on Earth, and I can call anybody anywhere at any time nearly. And that is incredible to me. And I think that, I hope that your generation doesn't take it for granted, but I think it's amazing that you're growing up with that opportunity to realize that any, the things that we do on the other side of the planet impact and affect others on the other side of the planet. And what that means is uh, all of us really live within the same habitat. When we look down on Earth, what we see from space is a community of people, one single community, not different nations. We see one atmosphere, shell, one protective skin spacecraft, and that's our atmosphere that protects us on our spaceship. So to me, Earth is a spaceship, and it's hurtling through space, and we're all actually crew members of that spacecraft. And I hope that the model that we have shown uh, here on the space station with international cooperation between all of the partners all of the nations who have a desire to participate in this project and do participate, um, we show that we can work together technically on Earth and we can work together professionally as astronauts in space, uh, even though politically some of our nations uh, uh, see great differences. So I hope that because your generation is coming up with humans in space, uh, that you will realize the need to see this as a model and see behavior, performance, and our interactions as a model for the way that uh, humans should act and behave uh, on Earth. Uh, hi, my name is Sophia Chen. I go to Lakeside School in Seattle, Washington. And my question is, how would you sum up the importance of the ISS to humankind and the world? Over. <laughs> that allows me to elaborate on the answer that I just gave. Uh, I see space as the future of humankind. I see, I believe that there is a need for us to learn to live off of the planet and embrace space and space exploration. Uh, we don't really know what's out there. Uh, uh, the Hubble telescope and other instruments have shown us that there are many possibilities, I believe, for life in space and many opportunities for humans or a species like ours to exist out in space. And we also know the perils of having only one planet to live on. And at NASA, we call that a single fault tolerant, which means if you lose that one protection uh, that you have, you could be done for. And so um, I think the key is that space, uh, ISS is a stepping stone that's going to allow humans to learn to live in space and work in space and live off the planet and find ways to continue our existence. Okay, hi, my name is Elliot Lee and I'm from Seattle, Washington, Bellarmine Prep High. Um, so how does NASA track the increasing amount of space debris? Does it pose a threat to the ISS? Over. That's a good question, and it's a common problem, a, a constant problem for us in space. Uh, there is always a threat of debris in space, and debris can be natural debris that's uh, been created by the universe and that, that flies around the things that have, uh, for example, uh, made the dinosaurs extinct and created large uh, craters in, in many orbiting bodies around the sun. But there's also man-made debris 
um, those things that are created by exploding satellites or uh, even debris, for example, that even myself created on my last spacewalk where I, I lost a small piece of wire. But that wire traveling 17,000 miles an hour in the opposite direction of a spacecraft, for example, could do uh, a great amount of damage. So uh, there are uh, individuals and uh, departments at NASA that track space degree, uh, debris, and the Air Force uh, Space Command also has an organization um, that or uh, that, that uh, tracks space debris and provides that, that, uh, those details to NASA on a regular basis so that if we need to, we can adjust our orbit um, by uh, using a, uh, propulsive, uh, a propulsive burn to increase the speed of the space station. And by doing so, that actually raises its altitude or changes its altitude with respect to the, any object that we see that may be on a collision course with the space station or meets certain criteria to be within a certain range from hitting the space station. Uh, hello, my name is Saipranav Venkatakrishnan. Um, do you got that? Um, <laughs> you can call me Sai. Yeah. So my question to you is, how did you know you wanted to be an astronaut, and what age were you when you realized? Over. Well, um, I was fairly young when I realized that I wanted to be an astronaut, but for me, it wasn't so much that I wanted to be an astronaut. It was more that I believed that someday I would be an astronaut and have an opportunity to work in the space program. I don't know why that is. I grew up watching science fiction uh, television and science fiction movies, and I always thought that that would be a neat thing to do when I grew up, but I had it in the back of my mind that that's what I would do, that someday I'll have that opportunity. I was very, and I've been very lucky in my life uh, to find myself here today speaking with you and sharing that story. I think that I always had uh, subconsciously that drive in my head that said, um, that, that allowed me to continue on with my career and my training and, and reaching my goals um, that allowed me to be fortunate enough to be selected as an astronaut now. Hello, my name is Peyton Kelly Van Domlin, and I'm homeschooled from Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. And my question is, aside from STEM courses, what elective college courses did you take that have proven to be beneficial in your career as an astronaut? Over. That's, that, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but uh, I was a mechanic. I was a professional mechanic for several years. I took shop class uh, growing up and uh, you know, found ways to, uh, to, look at, uh, to look at other uh, venues and trading that could benefit uh, just the work that I did every day. So, so mechanics was just something I was interested in. I, I grew up in Detroit, so I always enjoyed, I was interested in automobiles and I enjoyed working on cars. Those skills, those apprentice type skills, skills of uh, welding and metalworking and uh, plumbing, electrical work, those things have all been very helpful to me uh, on the space station. In fact, a lot of the things that we do up here uh, are center around maintenance and just keeping the space station functional. So I rely on those skills. Those aren't necessarily STEM skills. They're not science skills. Those are practical skills that I use not only here every day, but also when I'm back, uh, back home on Earth. Hi, I'm Caitlin Twesme, and I am from Lake Mills High School. And my question is, looking at how the involvement of women in space-related and scientific fields has changed, where do you believe it'll go in the future? And specifically, where do I believe women will be in the future, or where do I believe humans and space exploration will be in the future? Well, um, I think how, how involved women will be in the space programs will be. Well, yeah, it's, women are already heavily involved in the space program, and women make great leaders, and I don't see any reason why we should think otherwise. Um, I, I don't feel that um, we're lacking in, in that area right now, although uh, statistics would show that we are. And I would encourage women and young girls to pursue uh, careers in STEM, science, engineering, technology, mathematics. History has proven that um, women make great leaders. And uh, 
and we are all extremely receptive to, to that idea. And I think you should continue to follow your dreams um, just like anybody else. Uh, Place a goal out there that is as high as you can, as high as you can see or imagine, and then go for it. Nothing really should shut, stop you. I don't, I don't believe there are any obstacles in your way. Hello, I'm Sydney Wagner. I'm from Vista, California, and my question is: If you could give yourself one piece of advice at our age, what would you say and why? Over. Well, I've already sort of said it, and that is uh, don't, don't give up on your dreams. I also believe that anything is possible. Uh, I had no idea coming out of high school uh, with mediocre grades and uh, attending community college uh, that I would ever end up being an astronaut. I went out from community college to attain, attain a PhD in seismology and worked for one of the largest oil companies in the world, Exxon Mobil. And then, and then eventually made it here uh, to NASA, and I've been here at NASA for 18 years. Uh, when I was young, I heard somebody say to me, you can do anything you want, your dreams are all possible, uh, believe in them. I really, I thought it was a cliche, but knowing that I made it from high school and community college and not really knowing what I want to space, space exploration, really is proof that anybody can do anything they want and you just need to uh, open the doors that are in front of you. Don't leave any un opportunities uninvestigated. Uh, take every chance that you can and don't lose sight of those dreams. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evie Carrington. I'm also from Vista, California and my question is what is a typical day like on the International Space Station? A typical day is pretty busy. I know there's some representatives from NASA at the uh, at, at the conference now that, that could explain to you in, in detail. That's good eye. But uh, essentially, the one thing that's guaranteed for us is uh, eight and a half hours of scheduled sleep, uh, an hour of lunch, an hour and a half of breakfast, and a couple hours uh, at night of uh, downtime before we go to bed. And the rest of the day is uh, different. Every day is different. We're scheduled for work. Uh, we, uh, for about eight and a half hours a day. And that means that uh, we spend our days uh, not only doing science, but maintenance and upkeep of the space station, and also taking opportunities to uh, speak with folks like you. Um, so a typical day involves waking up all at the same time. There's six crew members on orbit. We all wake up uh, for a conference at about 7.30 in the morning, so we get up an hour earlier. Uh, we have that morning conference, and then we get to work. Lunchtime is usually staggered a bit, um, but then in between lunch and sleep, uh, we'll have uh, about two and a half hours scheduled for exercise and the rest of the time is work. And every day is different. That's what's amazing about being up here is that you can expect that you'll see something new or experience something new every single day. And 200 days, uh, by the time I'm done with 200 days on orbit, I won't be surprised if I never saw an event or task repeat exactly the same way that it was the days prior. So that's, that's what's neat about being up here, is that you really never know what to expect. Sometimes there's curveballs, and uh, you just have to sort of go with the flow. But uh, we enjoy it up here. We try not to take it for granted. We realize this is a very special place to be. And our real objective is to try and share stories and our experiences with people on Earth so everybody can engage in this and understand uh, what our future holds for us in space. Hi, my name is Adela Cervantes, and I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. And my question for you is, if you had a choice of fast food on the space station, what would it be? And j please repeat the question if I had, I didn't catch the last part, something secret to be on the space station. Oh, uh, sorry. If, if you had a choice of fast food on the space station, what would it be? Um, you know, I don't really eat that much fast food uh, when I'm on Earth, so it's hard to say. But I can tell you that uh, right about now, after being in space for four months, I could really go for a big juicy hamburger. So it probably wouldn't care too much about what branding it had. It just needed to be a nice juicy hamburger. 
Um, hi, I'm Jack Timmons uh, from Charlottesville, Virginia as well. And I was wondering what your favorite experiment on the ISS has been. Oh. Shucks. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a tough question. I can't say that I have a favorite because as I mentioned before, every day is different and we have over 250 experiments going on, ongoing um, throughout several increments on board the International Space Station. Um, so it's tough to say. Uh, I like it when we're growing plants or grass or flowers on the International Space Station. Right now we have an algae experiment going on. Uh, we're looking at uh, mobility and fertility, uh, fertility and reproduction issues. We're looking at uh, gene, um, sorry, we're looking at uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, med medication related to uh, cancer treatment. Um, and we're also looking at, uh, I guess we have the Project Genes in Space as well, although I haven't been working on that too much. Um, there's a lot of neat things going on here, and it's, it amazes me to see the details of what those things are. Um, but I can't say that I have a favorite because I don't want to call one out, but uh, suffice it to say that every day is something a little bit different and very interesting. Drew, I know we don't have too much more time with you. Um, one last question. While I'm on stage with a lot of middle school and high school students, the demographic of our audience is a bit older. Um, what would you suggest, what advice would you give to parents and maybe educators on how to get younger kids excited about space exploration? Yep. Is it gonna happen again? Yeah, okay. Well, I think that was probably the end of it. Is that, is that what that looks like? Okay, well, thanks to Drew. <laughs>Those are always quick. You never know when they're going to end. But thank you all for your questions. Those were all very, very good questions. We're going to keep it up with the student presentations on their experiments. And the next, uh, the next team, I believe, is Wisconsin Space Crystals. Is that right? Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Peyton Kelly Van Domlin, and this is Caitlin Twisme, and it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you about the Wisconsin Space Crystal mission. Our team consists of four members who won top prizes during the 2017 annual Wisconsin Crystal Growing Contest. The team members are Caitlin, me, and Olivia and Thomas. Our team is led by Dr. Ilya Guzze, the Director of Crystallography at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Chemistry Department. So the goal of our experiment was that we were going to crystallize the compounds of cupric sulfate pentahydrate and potassium dihydrogen phosphate aboard the International Space Station and to compare these crystals to the ones grown on Earth. We believe that because of the absence of convection and sedimentation due to the conditions of microgravity, that we would be able to create clear crystals of higher quality. So our experiment uses thermal gradient technique, which means that crystals form when the temperature of the solutions is lowered from 20 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius. We originally were testing a system of syringes like this one for our experiment, but because we could not isolate the crystals, we chose to contain our 35 and 50 milliliters of solution in bags instead. We studied different growth periods to mimic the experiment duration aboard the ISS. The key feature of our experiment is that it's entirely contained in a closed system. Bags will contain the solution prior to and during the experiment, and syringes extract the solution once the experiment's brought back to room temperature. At this step, the bag will flatten out, as shown in this picture here, and that means that the crystals are separated from the solution, which means that they won't dissolve back into the solution. All these materials are simple and inexpensive, and this makes them very easy to replicate. A large Bitron bag surrounds the system in accordance to CAS's regulations. We sent eight systems up to the ISS two 35 milliliter and two 50 milliliter vessels for each compound. The astronauts involved in our experiment are Drew Feustel, Ricky Arnold, and Scott Tingle. First, the astronauts checked the bags to ensure that there was no crystal growth prior to the start of the experiment. 
Then on April 11th, the bags were placed in a four degree Celsius refrigerator so that the solutions inside them would crystallize. After seven days, crystals of potassium dihydrogen phosphate formed in all four bags. The cupric sulfate pentahydrate the cupric sulfate pentahydrate crystal is formed after 13 days, but only in three bags. Since no crystal growth is observed in one bag, the astronaut was instructed to purposefully agitate the solution by harshly manipulating the bag, which introduced more potential nucleation sites. The solution in that bag eventually crystallized after 19 days. Once the crystals had formed in the bags, the astronauts extracted the remaining solution to isolate the crystals for their return to Earth. In the end, all eight bags that we sent came back with space crystals. Once our space crystals returned to Earth, many tests were performed and compared with our control experiments. The crystallization experiments on Earth and our microgravity produced crystals of the same composition with the same lattice structure. This was confirmed by single crystal X-ray diffraction, Raman spectrometry, thermogravimetric analysis, and melting point measurements. Upon optical inspection using a Leica microscope, the space crystals appeared to have a smoother surface than the Earth-grown crystals. The crystallization yields were comparable and within the limits of our theoretical yields. Some of the results are still pending, but will likely confirm that the space and Earth-grown crystals are indistinguishable with an experimental error. Through this amazing opportunity, I've grown in many areas, but notably in my public speaking. Patreon and I were featured in a new segment of the project on Channel 27 WKOW News, located in Madison, Wisconsin and I was interviewed for an article in my town's local paper. I was also able to witness unique career possibilities that I never would have previously known of, such as when our team had the opportunity to use the VR equipment of Dr. Braddock, who uses this technology to study molecules. My favorite part of this experience was definitely being treated like a professional the entire time. I've undoubtedly learned a great deal and acquired many valuable skills. In my experience with the Space Crystal mission, not only did I have direct exposure to crystallography, but I also gained several supplemental benefits, such as presenting to a large audience, answering questions from audience members, facilitating a poster session with the general public, and learning new software through the design of the mission logo and posters. I also got to work with scientific experts in a professional lab environment. The Space Crystal mission has provided other scientific opportunities for me as well. I won a full tuition academic scholarship to attend Space Academy in Huntsville, Alabama in August. I have also recently gained early admission into the University of Wisconsin Colleges. There is no doubt that my experience with the Space Crystal mission has helped me obtain these opportunities. A big thanks to all the people who helped us in the Space Crystal mission. Thank you for your attention and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. to welcome to the stage uh, the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. Hi, my name is Evie Carrington and this is Sydney Wagner. Our team is comprised of five students in grades 8 through 10. We recently published our work in the Women's in Science edition of the Frontiers Journal. We would like to acknowledge one of our team members, Charlotte Carrington, who is in the audience today, however, was unable to present with us. At the time of this study, we were all middle school students at Vista Magnet Middle School in Vista, California. Our, stu our study launched on August 14th, 2017 to the International Space Station, focused around the question, can Degesia japonica regenerate under the effects of microgravity? Our team was a part of the Student Space Flight Experiments Program, Mission 11. The Student Space Flight Experiments Program provides students with the opportunity to send an experiment to the International Space Station. Students compete nationally by submitting their formal proposal and research. The winning proposals are then turned into reality by the team, conducting both preliminary and ground experiments, as well as writing up procedures. After the mission has been started, the teams are invited to present their findings at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. For our experiment, we attempted to study the regeneration process of Degeusia japonica on the ISS. Degeusia japonica are a species of planarian, which are pond-living flatworms. D planarian worms are best known for their ability to regenerate missing organs from small fractions of the initial worm. Th this process is assisted by stem cells, which are undifferentiated cells that are able to become any type of cell needed in the organism. There are many species of planarian, however, we decided to use Degesia japonica as they are less susceptible to harsher climates and conditions. 
This is important to research as stem cells are currently being studied around the world with hopes to be used to repair damaged tissues. We were required by the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program to use a fluids mixing enclosure, also known as an FME. We decided to use the type 2 FME characterized by a single clamp. The first volume contained 10 Degizia japonica pre-cut tails in 8 milliliters of crystal geyser alpine spring water by the recommendation of Dr. Eva Maria S. Collins from the University of California, San Diego. The second volume contained 1 milliliter formalin with 37% formaldehyde to preserve the worms. Before the experiment was launched, preliminary tests were taken to measure to um, sorry to um, to measure the viability of refrigeration and fixation among the worms. Preliminary tests taken at the lab, Dr. Collins' lab at the University of California, San Diego, revealed that Degisa japonica can last for three weeks in refrigeration at four degrees Celsius and a further two weeks in room temperature. We also found that when fixed with the formalin after the five weeks, the Degisa japonica curled up and became fuzzy, however, were able to be observed. On July 23, 2017, our team prepared the ground truth and flood experiments in the FME tubes. On this day, both were placed in four degrees Celsius storage, and the flight experiment was shipped to the launch site in Houston, Texas. The anticipated launch was August 10th. However, due to a schedule slip, the experiment launched on August 14th, where it was held in room temperature until September 4th. On this day, the formaldehyde was released and shaken into the spring water, preserving the planarian worms. On September 15th, 2017, the return to Earth vessel holding the experiment splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. The fluid mixing enclosures were opened to find that both of the ground truth experiments, which mirrored the flight experiment's timeline, and the flight experiment had all disintegrated. The Degeza japonica in the flight experiment appeared to have disintegrated to a higher degree than those in the ground truth experiments, most likely due to uh, the turbulence to and from the ISS. Final experiments were conducted changing several variables to determine the cause of the disintegration. Post-flight experiments were set up testing different variables such as glass tubes and culture tubes as opposed to the FME, varying how much oxygen was present in each tube and adjusting how long the experiments were kept in four degrees Celsius. These experiments determined that the cause of disintegration was likely due to the increased time at four degrees Celsius because of the launch slip and the lack of oxygen. The Student Spaceflight Experiments program has allowed us to experience on first hand what real science looks like while giving us the opportunity to build on skills vital for our futures. It has been a unique experience. Opportunities included sending our experiment to the International Space Station, presenting in Washington, DC, and our team was published by Frontiers in the Cosmology section. We have built on skills such as collaboration with audiences and professionals. But most importantly, it is not often that we, as young adults, have the opportunity to engage in and understand what real science looks like and what a science career really entails. We hope that the findings of our study will help to increase the viability of future biological SSCP experiments. So we're gonna wrap up with our acknowledgements. These are all the people that helped us through our experiment. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And the last team, Zero Robotics. So hi, uh, I'm Jack Timmons. I'm from Charlottesville High School. I recently graduated, and I've been doing Zero Robotics for the past three years. Uh, hi, my name's Adela Cervantes, and I'm a rising junior at Charlottesville High School, and I've been on the Zero Robotics team for one year. So we're both here red, uh, repping a club called Bacon at our high school, and, oh. Uh, BACON basically stands for the best all-around club of nerds. We've been doing ZR for nine years, and as our name entails, we try to engage in as much nerdy activity as we can, and sometimes that's launching high-altitude balloons, sometimes it's touring CERN and having lunch with particle physicists, but today it's zero robotics. So, our school has been participating in the zero robotics competition for the last nine years. Every each year we've been very successful and have made it to the ISS finals. So outside of our season, we hold training sessions for people that wish to join Zero Robotics during the actual season. And these training sessions include guided tutorials and many competitions. Cool, so what is Zero Robotics? 
So Zero Robotics is a programming competition that consists of three simulated phases and then one actual phase. And it is a competition where students program uh, these spheres, or synchronize, position, hold, engage, reorient experimental satellites, to compete against other spheres in a game. So each year we get a new story and an objective that our game is based off. And the one this year was scientists have discovered life on Enceladus, which is a moon on Saturn. And so the, the objective of the game was to see which sphere could mine the most bacteria. Cool. So the first phase of this competition is the 2D practice phase. It occurs in simulated space and it basically is aimed at introducing all the competitors to the competition itself. Uh, we typically split up into small groups to, to explore weird, wacky strategies. And so in this phase, we ended up in 31st place. And that's the playing field. Okay. So the next phase is the 3D phase. And so pretty much it just adds a z-axis to the game. And so a fun fact is this last season, we actually earned first place in the entire world for our 3D phase. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> and the next phase is the alliance phase, which is also pretty cool because we get to um, form an alliance with two other teams from around the world when they can't be from your same country. So that's really cool. And actually, we got to meet our Romanian teammates this year at MIT. And we also had an alliance with a team in Paris. So. Cool. So the last final, oh, and that's the alliance simulated space. Mm -hmm. So the last final and coolest phase of this competition is the ISS finals, where when, their student, when students submit code, instead of running in simulated space, it gets sent up to the ISS where it competes against other actual spheres aboard the ISS, and the games are refereed by astronauts. Um, while being a pretty cool thing that you can do in high school, the ISS finals also really introduces students to the differences between programming sort of theoretically and having to deal with like experimental noise of actually trying to make an actual sphere work. Um, this is a cool graphic. If somebody wants to ask me about it, we don't have time. <laughs> Okay, so we were able to use Git for v version control, and it really helped us collaborate, and it facilitated our management, which was really convenient. And it was even better because we were able to use an open Chrome ex extension developed by Jonah Wiseman, who was one of our teammates, and it actually helped us a lot this year. Cool, okay, so we're going to quickly go through three impacts that we found in this competition. The first is problem solving. So life is like a huge medley of problems that all require solutions just about. And the problem solving skills strengthened by this competition can really be applied anywhere. And the next one is knowledge. So um, we were able to introduce vector operations to some of the participants along with helping, helping them develop polished low level code, low level code, which is actually pretty impressive. So. Cool. And the third is communication. Writing polished code is really hard when you're also attending high school, and it becomes even harder when your teammates are in Romania and France. So cornerstone being the cornerstone, sorry, communication being the cornerstone of all teamwork is very important. And lastly, we'd just like to thank the sponsors of this competition, all the coordinators and undergrad students who help run it, and And we'd also like to thank our school, Charlottesville High School, and our principal, Dr. Arizari, our superintendent, Dr. Rosa Adkins, and our mentor, Matthew Shields. Cool. Thanks for having us. So can we have another round of applause for all of these students? It's very scary to get up in front of a group of people this large. You guys did a great job. So. I have a couple questions um, for the entire group. Can you guys raise your hands if you went to the launch yourself? So a few of you. So those that did, can you talk about your experience? What did you launch on? How did it feel to watch a rocket launch knowing you had something on that rocket? Sai, did you want to talk about your experience? Oh, yeah, you guys. Thank you. 
It was amazing seeing the rocket launch. It was mind blowing because you never seen a rocket launch in person. It's always just like on TV. Ooh, in TV, it's so amazing. But when you're actually there, it's 10 times more amazing. And I remember calling my mom saying, <laughs> oh my God, my experiment is in space. And then she's saying, Sai, stop talking to me and look at your experiment. I'm not important right now. <laughs> And so the launch is amazing, and we and me and my teammates were cheering uh, that our experiment is going to space. You never actually expect that this is going to happen until it does. Um, I know me and my partner can say definitely for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, Lisa and Sophia, do you want to <laughs> talk about your experience? And what did you launch on? What you launched on a Falcon, is that right? Falcon Nine. Great. What about you guys? Uh, yeah, I think our experiment was also on the same um, capsule as theirs. <laughs> um, yeah, it was absolutely thrilling. Um, it was, like they said, almost um, like we hadn't imagined that our experiments could actually be heading to the International Space, Space Station before that day, and it was almost like surreal. Like we couldn't <laughs> really believe it. Like it's oh my god, it's actually going up. And um, yeah, do you have any? Um, I think the moment that I realized that it was actually happening was like the, the whole ground starts shaking and you kind of feel it all throughout your body and just very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Now, you all have various mentors that help you with these programs. Does anyone want to talk about how those mentors have helped you and how useful that's been for your experience? Because there's a lot of people involved in these programs that are volunteering their time. Yeah. Definitely. So our mentors, uh, like when we first started the project, me and Sai and the rest of the team, we knew nothing, like absolutely nothing about <laughs> how to start it, how to continue it, how to like plan and coordinate. Well, I wanted to give a shout out because I didn't get, get it. Um, I want to shout out Mr. McFarlane, Ms. Cassidy, Mr. Marks, and Dr. Short for helping us in the project and experiment. Um, but anyway, they helped us um, learn our electronic coding, our software, our hardware, our camera, our communications. Without them, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, um, so my experience, my experience with the Student Space Flight Experiments program was rather different. Um, for the Student Space Flight Experiments program, we try, uh, our teacher facilitator tried her best to be hands-off so that we had the true experience of learning what science is in the whole process. So we got to completely re-look at what a scientist really do. And it was very, she guided us. However, it was mostly student-led. And that helped us to really see what the scientific process is and what it does. Uh, go ahead, you, yeah, you were. Uh, just to add to that, we were also similarly student-led, but it's still a really big thing to be given like a space to work on your projects and help if you need it to work on your projects and just being backed by having a teacher and being backed by your school system is just also incredible. Yeah, go ahead. So we were led by Ilya, Dr. Guze from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and he was very, very helpful in this experiment. He was the one who originally put the contest together, which allowed us all to have a part in it, and who has guided us along and been in just incredible role model, and he's been wonderful. Thank you to him. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up here. We're out of time. But thank you all so much for giving your presentations. You all did such a good job. Thank you. Thank you. One more, one more applause, because these guys are really, really special, these ladies and gentlemen. Awesome job.
So my name is Ken Shields. I'm Director of Operations and STEM Education at uh, CASIS in the ISS National Lab. And it's my great honor to present a couple of new awards that we're doing for the first time this year. So these are inaugural world, uh, awards uh, in STEM education. We've got an educator award uh, and a student award. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll get on with it. Um, so the first award is the CASIS Space Station Explorer Exceptional Educator Award which rec recognizes an educator who has gone above and beyond in their dedication and their passion for their craft. Uh, they also have done outstanding work in using, utilizing, applying ISS-related programs to engage students in STEM subjects and hopefully careers. This year's award winner is Ms. Nicole Seeley, who is a middle school educator at Bach Academy in Lake Wales, Florida. Nicole has been teaching for 12 years and has won several regional awards for excellence in education. As a space station ambassador, Nicole has helped other teachers bring ISS activities into their schools, classrooms, and communities. She is extremely involved in her community, bringing opportunity to a lot of young folks who would never see the types of programs and the types of experiences that they're able to take advantage of through what, what Nicole brings them. As an example, just a few months ago, we were at risk of, of losing our ability to participate in Florida with MIT Zero Robotics program. Uh, Nicole was, was a veteran of that program for, for several years and just simply, she wasn't gonna take that for an answer. So she jumped in, got involved, went to MIT, got trained and ran that program in Florida uh, to, to allow us in Florida to continue to have Zero Robotics uh, without interruption. Um, Nicole, come on up. It's my honor to introduce everyone to Ms. Nicole Seeley, the 2018 winner of the CASIS Space Station Explorer Exceptional Award winner. Um, thank you. This was worth every bribe. <laughs> And they said it couldn't be done with box tops. Um, <laughs> I cannot stress to you enough how important it is to have opportunities like this to inspire. Um, teachers want to bring everything in the entire world and universe to our students. And in places like my town, in the middle of nowhere in Florida, um, second in the nation for food insecurity for students, um, many of them don't even leave the county, and it's only through programs like this and your willingness to um, reach out through um, programs like this, but also in your own community uh, that gives these kids the vision and the possibility to consider this, to dive into this, to remove the distance and allow them to feel that they too can participate and contribute, and I cannot express enough how incredibly important. That moment, that time, that look, that encouragement, that one thing that you say is, and how many lives you can change. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Those are uh, great words. Um, so now, uh, on to the next award. And uh, in, in education, uh, particularly in cases, we're always um, ensuring and trying to understand what is the impact that we're making. It, it's easy enough for us to count uh, the, our participants, both uh, educators, students, uh, uh, citizen scientists, but the impact is really what we're after. And, and so we believe that, that our, our student award winner uh, of the case of Space Station Explorers Exceptional Student Award winner is a great example of impact and what these programs can mean to people, not only in their education and their career choices, but their lives. And uh, our, our Space Station Exceptional Student Award winner this year is Jalissa Herrera. Jalissa is a recent high school graduate who is currently attending Evergreen Community College in San Jose. At one time, Jalissa was on the pathway of actually dropping out of school. She wasn't really excited about going to class and, and learning and, and just was at a point, I think, in her life where she was about to go and, and who knows what sort of path that may have led to. Um, she got involved with a, an at-risk uh, program, um, intervention program, if you will, and she participated in one of our partner programs called Quest for Space. And they're here, you can talk to the, to the Quest for Space folks in the uh, exhibitor hall. Um, 
In, in Jalissa's role as a mechanical engineer, a mechanical engineer on her team, she, she understood that she can make value contri valuable contributions. And she learned she could do this stuff. It wasn't that hard uh, when she really started to apply herself. And she, she also, I think, learned that she could be a valuable contributor to her community as well. So without further ado, I want to bring up Jalissa Herrera, uh, this year's uh, 2018 Space Station Explorers Exceptional Student Award. Jalissa? Um, well, I just want to thank everybody that has um, always pushed me and motivated to me to try my best. And um, I do think programs like these that um, are constantly um, going out and seeking um, kids that do need programs like these, like I know I needed it, something to push me and motivate me. And But I am thankful and I know that... Um, this program is will help a lot of people, not just me. And I am thankful that I was able to get the help that I needed. And I just um, hope all each and every one of us here can, you know, push and motivate each other to go and try new things that you know we never thought we would try. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Jalissa and Nicole, that was awesome. Um, so just one, one parting thought. Um, we heard some, from some awesome students today. Uh, thank you to Emily for a great, great panel. That was uh, fantastic, and, and the award winners. W one thing I wanna throw out to the audience, um, you saw a lot of uh, uh, really, I, I think, inspiring information that was shared here today. And I think we should all receive that also as a call to action because we, we can't do this alone, and, and we're not doing it alone. We have a, a, a fantastic consortium and partner of programs uh, who contribute to this valuable mission. But everyone in this room, particularly our, our industry partners, uh, we can do more, we must do more. Uh, whatever little bit you can contribute, or a big bit that you can contribute, will take a lot, uh, will help the mission. So if you, if you have that passion and if you can receive that, that sort of call to action, uh, please reach out to myself, Dan Barstow, anyone at, at CASIS uh, and the National Lab, and, and we will find a way that you can help. And it's not always money. It can be all sorts of uh, different activities, mentorship, uh, and involvement. So uh, please consider that and, and help us in the mission. With that, we'll close the session. Thank you very much for your attention. We appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of the uh, conference and safe travels home.